Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode 113. Our guest today is landscape photographer Jonathan Gewitz. 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 Close, Gewitz. Gewurz. Yes. Gewurz. Jonathan Gewurz. I forgot to ask him how to pronounce his name. Can you believe it? Anyway, Jonathan calls himself a photo opportunist. He is, has very limited time, so he's going to teach us how to make every photo opportunity work. But first, did you know that we have several free downloads on our website that you might be interested in? It's Our website is understandphotography.com. We've got what camera should I buy? I mean, a lot of people are new to photography and they just don't know what camera to buy, so I go through what I recommend and why. Um, we also have a download called What You Need to Learn to Become a Solid Photographer. That's not a download, um, excuse me, that's a video. That's a video that talks about, it kind of gives you a plan of action. So, you know, you need to learn to shoot a manual. What do you need to learn? That'll give you that. We have a travel photography essentials download. And then our latest thing is called 30 Unique and Practical Gifts for Photographers. And of course, on that is uh, our book. Joe Fitzpatrick and I, Peggy Farron, wrote a book called Florida Photo Spots, Naples and Collier County. So it's a guidebook for Collier County, including the Western Everglades. So you're gonna find all the best spots for photography. And then we go through each what each spot is good for. Is it good for portrait photography? Is it good for landscape photography, you know, wildlife, whatever, what time of day, where to go, all that kind of stuff. March 8th through the 10th is the Florida Camera Club Conference in Fort Myers. It's a, an amazing conference. They've got huge, great speakers. I know Lisa Langell is one of the uh, keynote speakers, and she's amazing. Of course, I'll be speaking. Joe Fitzpatrick will be speaking, too. And then remember to watch our, um, our podcast. You can watch the Understand Photography Show as a podcast or on YouTube, as well as live on Facebook on Fridays. Our class, our signature class, How to Get a Solid Photography Education in Four Weeks, starts November 13th, so that's this week. Okay, that's it for my commercials. I'm going to talk about my guest today is Florida-based photographer Jonathan Gewertz. Perfect. Did I do it perfectly? Yes, you did. Jonathan focuses his camera on landscapes and cityscapes from the Everglades of Florida to the streets of Miami to the rocky landforms of Utah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for And where exactly me. do you live in Florida? Miami. 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 Yes. Bienvenida a uh, Miami. It's Remember a good that place. song? <laughs> now, your portfolio is really diverse. So, do you have a favorite? You I, think have, I have many favorites. It varies. Okay. How's that? Uh, I, like, uh, I like the Everglades very much. So do I. And uh, you're in a very good part of it. Uh, the Turner River. It's Isn't it funny? Spot. It's always the the grass is always greener because I always think, oh, those people who live on the Miami side have such cool stuff, it's <laughs> and true. you think it this way, huh? <laughs> no, it's it's good to mix things up. And it's good to see things. But it, from the Everglades has how many different um, what do you call it terrains? Uh, many. Because we've got the many. wood. We got different woodlands. Yeah, we've uh, got the the pine, the pine rocklands, areas. the marshes. Uh, it's amazing. Lakes. It's it's a unique environment. It's awesome. I agree. It's awesome. So that's your favorite. Uh, and landscapes. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Yes, it's my favorite now. Maybe it'll change. Next week it'll be something different, uh, huh? Maybe next year. <laughs> yeah. There are many many nice things to see in the world, but uh, I think we're fortunate to be near near the Everglades. I do too, I love it, I love it. Now you describe yourself as a photographic opportunist. Opp opportunist, I can't talk today. What does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, I like to take advantage of where I am. I don't have infinite time and I wanna see, I wanna see what's here. Uh, uh, I, when I came to Florida, I, I didn't know what was here, I started doing more outdoor activities because it's a great place for it. Nice to be outside, and especially this time of year. It's fantastic. Although it's actually a little hot. It's a little hot. <laughs> Which is, it's, it's, I know, I'm sorry for all you guys with snow. <laughs> it's getting better. And uh, I started to notice things and I started to visit places and like uh, in the Everglades. And uh, over time you see patterns and if you keep coming back to these places, you see more patterns and you see what time of day it, it looks good, what time, what season it looks good, what weather 
looks good. And uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not like one of these people who travels all over and takes a picture in a new place each time. I'm trying to become the best photographer of things that are near to me that I can get to. Okay, well, you know what, that's, I think that's really good because for me, I have extremely limited time. You know, like today, I had a private lesson, but I don't take pictures during private lessons. Right. The customer takes private lessons, so just because I was out in a beautiful environment, I didn't get any pictures. So that started at 8. I'll probably finish my day at 8.30 at night. So when am I going to take the pictures I want to take, you know? I have to really squeeze in the time. So I, well. I appreciate that, that you're talking about doing it on limited time. So if you have limited time, what are some, what are some tips? For, okay, like I have a crazy schedule. Obviously, to schedule it is my my advice because if it's not on my schedule, I'm never going to take a picture except a, to work. You have to you have to work around your time. You have to make time. You have to get up early. So you have to keep going back to places that you know okay. because the more you look at them, at least this is how it works for me, the better the results. Okay, what do you mean by that? Well, the first time you visit some place, you take pictures. Maybe if you're lucky, they're very good. Maybe if you come back, you'll get better lighting, weather conditions, uh, okay. how the sun uh, illuminates objects varies a lot throughout the year, the weather, the time of day. So does time of day make a huge difference on where you go? Uh, well, uh, it doesn't make a difference of where I go, but I like, to, I like to go to the same places at different times of day or at night. Oh, okay. And, uh, so it's, it's like, it's, like a, do you have a favorite spot in Miami? Uh, Miami is, is very attractive. I like Miami Beach. I like Little Havana. Okay, These so let's say you're going to go to Little Havana. Yeah. Is there something that you always take pic I've never been there, so that's not a good... How about it's South a, Beach? I've been to uh, South Beach. They're both fantastic places. Okay, so I'm taking pictures on South Beach of like, what is it, the Tides Motel and all those, that strip right there. I just go where the people are and take pictures of them. You don't take pictures of the architecture? Uh, occasionally. Whatever oh. looks good, but these are these are great opportunities for street photography, which in is in Miami, especially, especially yeah. on South Beach. <laughs> it's like New York; it's it's full of people, and that's what you want. So, okay, so you take pictures of, like you said, you, everything. I, I take pictures of everything. I take pictures all the time. You should carry your camera with you. You should have equipment with you in your car. Um, you should uh, make time early in the morning, you should make time in the evening, you should take advantage of events. If, uh, if you're interested in street photography, there are a lot of events in Miami Beach, uh, yeah. Halloween. Oh boy, it's incredible. that's crazy. Um, Little Havana is a very, uh, very colorful place, both uh, physically colorful and the culture. I can't believe I've never been there. Go there. I need to. Go to 8th Street, go to the Domino Park. Everybody goes there, but it's good. Okay and uh, spend some time. And now, what do you do with the street photography of people? Uh, not much. Mostly I... that I, doesn't really sell. No, it doesn't sell. I, I put it on my Flickr page and uh, occasionally enter it in contests, but uh, oh, okay. it's, well, it's mostly for me. Though. That's something I think, you know, contests are good because they help you hone your photography, I think, because you're going to work harder on that picture that you're going to submit than any other picture, right? Yes and no. Uh, I try to take, I try to get good pictures, but it's, it's a numbers game. And if you, if you keep going back and taking more pictures, eventually you get something that's good. But it's hard. Yeah. I like challenges. And yeah. Street photography is very challenging. Yeah. How do you go up to people? I don't. I just take pictures. I mean, you, you go to a place if with a lot of people. If they see you taking pictures, though, do they say, no, I don't want you to take my picture? Uh, occasionally. But and usually, you just usually, kind of say, oh, sorry, and move on? Yeah, occasionally. Mostly people don't care, like everything else in life. You know, most, most of us are, are in our bubbles, and nobody cares. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, when I, when I go to the Everglades, it's wide open. Now, do you have a favorite spot in the Everglades? Quite a few. Uh, actually, uh, some of the popular tourist spots are excellent. The Anhinga Trail is beautiful. Uh, Paheoke Overlook is beautiful. These what are is all the second one? Paheoke Overlook. These are all uh, oh, very close to the, the southeastern entrance on okay. the other side. Okay. Uh, they're, but they're very close. Anhinga and Trail, everybody, I know everybody and goes everybody there. Everybody goes there. But it's worth it. No, it's beautiful. But the time to go is early in the morning. 
uh, at sunset. Uh, at sunrise, at, you mean? Uh, no. Oh, sunrise Either or way. sunset. Yeah, at, at the extremes of light. Uh, and when the weather is, is uh, disturbed after a rainstorm, for example. Because of the clouds? Or? Yeah, because of the clouds. Ah, okay. Because of the clouds, and, and uh, I like the light in the summer. Um, there are a lot of bugs, but that's the trade-off. You have a bug jacket? Uh, I wear layers, and, and I put a net on my head. And I'll tell you what, that bug it, jacket was one of the best things I ever uh, bought. you got to get a bug jacket. I, I'll send I you probably, the link to I'll the one I have. <laughs> Please do. It's so funny because one of my friends who takes me out, Chris Hopkins, he takes me out in the Everglades a lot, and so he sent me a link. Oh, this bug jacket is on sale. Well, I have a big mouth and a big audience, so I told everybody, hey, this bug jacket is on sale, and it had to be that exact color. So now there are like 50 photographers in Naples, and we all have the exact same jacket. So if you ever see them in the Everglades, it's kind of creepy. I know what to look, <laughs> I know what to look for. <laughs> but those things work like crazy, even on no see -ems. They're amazing. You've got to get one. I'll get one. So, all right. So how do you train your eye to see a greater variety of compositions if you go to the same location all the time? It's easier if you go to the same location because you, you, you have time. If you're, if you're going to the scenic overlook, whatever, famous place uh, on, on your trip across the country, you, you stop for a few minutes, you take a picture at noon, it's not very good. If you keep going back to the same place, you have opportunities to, to go at different times, to try different angles. Uh, I think it's very helpful to try different lenses, to try different perspectives, oh, okay. uh, to use macro lenses. Uh, in the Everglades in particular, wherever you look down, there are beautiful things, plants, insects. Oh, yeah. Uh, to, uh, uh, it, it's, it's helpful to do these things. It's uh, 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 very helpful to, to come uh, at different times of the year. Um, just to change things up. So I, you just, and it's so funny you said that because I totally forgot. You know, we have something during the busy season called the Old Naples Photo Tour. We do it every Monday. And uh, I have a guy who mostly does it for me, but when we first started, Joe and I were doing it, and so we were splitting it every other week. And so every other week I was doing the same tour, and I get bored very, very quickly. And so I thought, well, what can I do to make this more interesting to me? And um, I, t I took a different lens or a different camera every single time I had some completely different lens so that it challenged me to see the same thing over and over differently and it was really a good exercise so I forgot about that because it's been about four or five years you know you, you have to so you do that a lot you, you just have, try different yeah. lenses in the same spot to see different, see what different lenses different perspectives uh, get and low uh, get low get high get high well it's hard to get high angle. but if you can yeah. It's good. Uh, well, one thing that I carry that, um, you know, those little plastic, you get them at like Home Depot or something. They're little, home, they're little plastic uh, yeah. stools that fold up perfect. and you have a handle. It's you perfect. know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And they come in several different sizes. So I keep a couple of them in my car. And today for the private lesson, we went to, um, you know, we were walking through this uh, mangrove area with, and I had my cart. It was my beach cart, so I always have it in there. And sure enough, I, we use that we use that little stool about four times just to try to get up higher, or, or sometimes to sit on, because you know sometimes you don't want to sit on the ground, especially in the Everglades. No, it's, it's a good idea. Mucky at times. Well, <laughs> you, you, it help it helps to be willing to go off the path, go on the water, go on the sand. Uh, it helps to have knee pads. It helps to have water shoes. Do you have water shoes? Yeah, sure. Like what kind of water shoes? Yeah, like uh, the kind you use for boating, uh, that you can walk in, you can immerse yourself, you don't have to worry about stepping on anything sharp. Or Crocs. Just Crocs will get sucked up off your feet, won't probably. they? Yeah, probably. I, I just use old tennis shoes and I tie them up real tight because the they get idea. sucked off your feet. Yeah, it's the same idea. So, because but they get so icky looking <laughs> and they stink. <laughs> it comes with the territory. But to get off, get off the road, get off the path, uh, go into the water, look behind you. Uh, oh, that's you know I, that's something everybody forgets to do. Is you know you're shooting and you're looking here, you're looking here, you're looking here. Well, turn around and look behind you. You're right. Sometimes there's a cool shot that way. There's always a cool shot that way. There's always or the other way. 
Well, the, you take a lot of pictures. The way you're not looking. <laughs> yeah, you take a lot of pictures. That, and, that is uh, really good advice. You keep at it, and I think what works for you might not work for me. You have to, you have to do what works for you. Now, do you go out there by yourself? Yeah, because uh, once in a while somebody will go with me, but uh, usually but I'm the only one. you don't go deep in the swamp by yourself, do you? Not too far. Yeah, okay, because that's not safe. It's not that bad. Well, I go out deep in the swamp often, but I would never go alone because if you broke your leg or something and cell phone service hardly ever works out there, you'd be doomed. You'd be alligator bait. No, you know, you'd well, be python bait. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I, uh, yeah. That's right. what I've heard, but so far I've made it. Have you ever seen a python out there? No. Oh, I have. I look for them, really? Yeah. How big? Not, not big. Not like the kind that they, those kind you see in the news, but like, I think the one, I've only seen one, and it was about seven, eight, seven, eight feet. That's pretty good. And that my friend, Chris, he went to try to pick it up. And, of course, the thing started, you know, lashing at it, and then it took yeah, off. They're, and I they're was scared like, of us. Well, I told him, if you're going to do something that stupid, you wait till I get my camera out, right? Jeez. Next time. So what, what's your go-to gear? Do you have, like, you know, standard gear that you always use? Yes. What is it? Uh, I have I have a I have a DSLR. I use a full frame or uh, yeah. I use a I'm using a fi an old 5D, but I have a wide zoom, a tele zoom. Uh, how wide and how, uh, how 70 to 200, and uh, I use a 17 to 40. Okay. Uh, and I I have it in a, a knapsack, which which is ready to go most of the time. So you just always that's your yeah. kit. Yeah. But you have other lenses too that you try on occasion as well. Yeah. Sometimes a macro. But, but usually when I, when I want to go out and I'm not sure what I'm going to find, I have just camera, wide zoom, tele zoom, uh, tripod. Uh, mm -hmm. Tripod mount, which I keep on the, on the camera, filters, batteries. That's it. Okay. And well, that's a nice kit, though. Lighter is better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sound that light. Well, I can keep it in a in a backpack. I have I have several ranges of of lightness. Yeah, that's not doesn't sound that light. I, I, I have lighter for for riding my bike. Or I was just going to ask you that because you ride your bike sometimes, and sometimes yes. you take a kayak, yes. and you just kind of get out wherever and whenever. So what what do you do when you have on your bike? Uh, on the bike, I usually carry a, a small mirrorless camera in my uh -huh. pocket, or if if I'm ambitious, I have a, a belt pack. It's a, a low pro. I don't know if they make this model anymore. It's, it's about this big. <sighs> I was looking at those on eBay. What the heck are they called? Because I have a belt pack and I love it. And it, I don't know, it, I don't even know what brand it is because it says Canon all over it because I wanted, you know, how you got door prizes for yeah. going to these conventions and things like that. And I, it's funny, I was, when I got it, I was a portrait photographer. I never used it. And then once I started, into nature photography and hiking, and I use it all the time now. I love yeah, it. They're excellent. I've had to take it to the shoe repair place because the zipper got broken and it started right. to fall. You know, so I've had it repaired. So I thought I need to get a backup. And everybody recommended these low pro. Damn, I wish I could remember what it's called. I, I don't remember, but it's you know you you go by size. You get the smallest one that holds your stuff. Usually yeah, well, most of us don't have camera stores just because you live in a big city. You know, Mr. Big Shot. Most of us can't go and look at things. <laughs> well. We have Amazon. <laughs> but you can't really tell. They give you the measurements and it's like, eh. You can't tell. You have to just try. Yeah. And, and Amazon, you can return it. You right? can return it. So I, I try to, you know, I, I try to put a, a 5D with a, like a, a 24 to 105 in it and with maybe a polarizer and an extra battery it fits. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I put adequate. in mine. Exactly. Yeah, it's perfect. Exactly what I put in mine. Yeah. Except for I have a 6D. <laughs> it's the same, but the I think the, it's a little smaller than the 5D. The event it's smaller, uh, yeah. and the mirrorless ones look even better. I think I'll get one next. But the the advantage of the Canons, I don't think Nikon does this quite as well, is that you have uh, several custom settings, and you can and and all the settings are saved. So I, I have a a landscape setting, and I have a night setting, and I have uh, a setting for live view. Really? Uh, landscapes. Uh, so, so you just save them in the camera, you just hit the button and it goes to those settings and then are you shooting in manual? Uh, not always. Usually aperture priority. But you still have to adjust a little bit? A little it, bit, yeah. Okay. A oh, little bit. That's but interesting. Uh, I think for, for all the, I know that people have favorites, but I like Canon for this reason alone. 
I think it's good enough and the menus are good enough and it doesn't break and it has the saveable custom settings which are golden. Yeah, I think Nikon has custom, I just don't know that. I, I don't use the custom settings mostly because I teach so much. I want my camera to look like everybody else's camera. Of course. You know? um, so, okay, so that's on the bike. What about on the kayak? How do you keep your stuff dry? Uh, I haven't completely solved that problem. <laughs> uh, I, I basically jam everything in a dry bag, usually in a, in a I have the, the camera and a lens in, in a, uh, in something like the Low Pro, and I, I put it in the dry bag, and maybe I have another lens wrapped in a towel or some foam, uh, and it's slow. But it, it's, it's slow, meaning you have to take it all out of that when you get to your spot. You have it with you, and and I've gotten some pictures that were, would have been impossible otherwise going to places that that I just wanted to go to. Like, so you kayak to a spot, and then do you get out of the kayak and uh, sometimes. Sometimes, uh, but sometimes you just have a faster shutter speed yeah. and take it from the boat. It's difficult. It's, it's trade-offs. Uh, sometimes you're in the boat and the boat is not stable. I know you you interviewed Connie Meyer, who I admire greatly. And she, she uses these sticks that, that... To stabilize her boat. She stabilizes her canoe, and that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, I haven't done that, but, uh, you know, when, when you're in shallow water, if it's not too windy, it usually works okay. okay. And at least you have a camera. Yeah, and you can just get out, too, and if you you're can in get shallow out. water. Yeah. You can get out. Right? How yeah. hard is it to get in and out of a kayak? Not bad. Not bad? Not bad. <laughs> I'm not a big kayaker. Yeah, the, the tripod is strapped outside. It can get wet, and when you're ready, you just jam it into the mud uh, carefully, carefully and put yeah. your camera on it and it, it works okay. And do you use the mirrorless for that too or you bring your big camera? No, I bring the big camera. Because you don't that. have to carry it, so right. it's in the boat. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Wow, that's so cool. Now, yeah. where, what are some of your favorites? Where do you go in the, on the boat? Uh, uh, you just Biscayne Bay often. That's uh, where Connie used to go all the time she talked about. Yeah, oh, maybe she yeah, still does. Yeah, she has some wonderful pictures. Uh, Biscayne Bay, the Everglades, uh, there, there are a in lot the of... the Everglades, you just go off a boat ramp? You see a boat ramp off the side of the road and go in? Or you just there, drag there are, it in through the marshy area? There or? are a few like that, like Hell's Bay, for example. Uh, or uh, near Flamingo, there, there, there's a ramp to... If, I example, see them all down 41 when I drive over to Miami. If you drive down 41, you see boat ramps all over the place. Yeah, but, but it's, not, it's not very scenic there. If no. you if you go... Oh, I don't you, know. I'm if you go to... Uh, Flamingo, which is also one of the darkest places in South Florida. So if you, if you ever want to take pictures of the stars or meteor showers, that's the place it's, to go. It's one of the places. The other place is near Turner River on 41. Um, Turner River. On, where do you go there? Uh, that's you, close, closer it, to me. <laughs> it's very close to you. It's about it's about half hour. There's there's a there's a kayak or canoe put in. Okay. And that's a how far away from 41? It's on 41. 41 and like on the corner there, that Hiram whatever park For, right 41 there? crosses Turner River and mm -hmm. there's a ramp, there's a parking lot here. Yeah. And you, you can... And bathrooms. I, yeah, there's a... <laughs> I know where all the bathrooms, bathrooms in the Everglades are. <laughs> and, and you get it, you, you go into a little canal and then you pass under 41 and, and go south towards uh, Chakalowski. And it's... Okay. It's excellent. Ah. It's, it's a place to go. I don't know, I've never been there at night, but it's very dark. Okay. Uh, and uh, as I was saying, Flamingo is a great is a great place for for sky photography. But also, if you're ever going, uh, for example, to Cape Sable, which is about a three or four hour paddle from Flamingo, that's where you start. Okay. You can go there on a on a real boat too. It's more fun in a in a kayak. Okay. And that's that's a very nice place. Uh, the uh, Cape Sable. Cape Sable. It's, a, it's actually a, a beautiful sand beach. It's it's about ten miles long, I think. It's very long, and if I don't, I, I haven't I haven't gone very far, but they have uh, very extensive uh, little tributaries that go inland from that area, and the the birding there is great. Oh gosh, now that's part of the Ten Thousand Islands, right? No, it's no? well, I think it's a little south. Okay, it's it's really very close to Flamingo. By, okay. by foot, but I don't think it's easy to walk there or drive there. I don't think you, you can't drive there, but there, well, there's a trail. You can't drive to most of the 10,000 islands or yeah. islands. <laughs> and actually, there are more than 12,000 islands, I learned. And Marco Island is the largest of them all. All the little trivia I have in my head. <laughs> it's, it's a nice island, too. You have good sunsets. We have beautiful sunsets. Now, you have a beautiful sunset here behind us. It's which, a sunrise. 
Oh, see, see, I, I think it, in terms of sunset <laughs> because it's, I live on this good. side of the it's world. Now, for our people who can't see this, because we have a lot of podcast listeners, this is uh, Pine Woods Forest, right? Am I yeah, right? Yeah, this is, this is near Mahogany Hammock, which is not far from the main road going south in Everglades National Park from the, the southeastern entrance. And depending on the season, the sun rises pretty much through some of the, uh, the pine hammocks. This is one of them. Uh, I took the picture actually from the road, despite what I said about getting off the road. Uh, it was just a beautiful morning. There was fog. Fog makes everything better. And this, this was a particularly scenic, uh, scenic now, sunrise. Now, a ham is a hammock because, okay, so for the people who can't see this picture, the, you see the pine trees and you can see the sun coming through because pine tree, they're not like, Christmas trees. No, they they're, have, they're, they're, thin. they're very thin and then they have needles on the top. So the sun is coming through the, the, the um, trunks of the trees. So right. it's really, really pretty. Now is a hammock, does that, what does that mean? Does that mean it's not a big thick, because that's not really a big thick woods or you wouldn't be able to see the sun right through those trees. That's right. It's, is it's, that what it means to uh, have a hammock? Is I that think, what a hammock means? Yeah, I, I think, know. I never I think questioned you, it. It's not quite, a, <laughs> not quite a forest. It's maybe a grove okay. or a copse. And uh, actually there are quite a few of these places uh, in the Everglades where you can get uh, very nice sunrise views. Uh, I like them when they're foggy, but to each his own. Uh, and how, is there a way to determine when it's going to be foggy the night sort before? Sort of, sort of. Uh, so you can plan, like, I'm going to get up tomorrow at 4.30 4 and go drive out to the you Everglades? Need, you need a certain balance between temperature and humidity. And usually this happens in the winter okay. or later in the winter before it gets really hot. Uh, ideally, something like uh, 4 degrees between four degrees um, Fahrenheit difference between the temperature and the dew point, which is the condensation point okay. in air. And you can find out what, what's going on with temperature and dew point by looking at one of the weather apps. Okay. So I, I look, for example, on weather, uh, weather underground, wunderground.com. Okay. The I'll others all have the same information. And you, you give it as close to, you give it the location as, as close to where you're going as possible. Okay. It's not exact, and it'll, it'll give you hourly predictions. Ah, so, so sometimes it'll say fog expected tomorrow morning. Yes, and it'll also, it'll also say the temperature 70, dew point 74, something like that, so you get an idea that it's possible. Ah. And then you just have to go there and take your chances. It's funny, because I, I have always been a night person and I have a girlfriend who's like always saying, you know, will you walk with me in the mornings? I'm like, I can't get up that early, but I have a big birthday coming up. So I got motivated because I need more exercise. So I've been getting up early to walk with her and we see the sunrise every, every day almost. And so now I'm on a mission because it's like, I've always wanted to have the beautiful foggy, you know, Everglades shots that I see, but I never could get up early enough. But now I get up early, so it's one of my little missions to get a nice foggy Everglades shot. <laughs> well, that's great to hear. Just now, you travel a lot as well? Or? I travel occasionally. And okay. I, I always, when I travel, like to take advantage of, of where I am. Mm -hmm. do you, so do you go with photographs in mind? Occasionally. There, there are a few places that I really like. Uh, one of them is Moab, Utah. I have mm. some pictures on my site. Uh, I think many people who go there to photograph find it to be a wonderful place. Yeah. It has... Uh, I've never been there, but I've seen a lot of pictures. You should go. It, it's, a, it's a photography paradise. You might have to get up early, uh, but so what? It'd probably be easier to get up early when you're on a different time zone, though. That too. <laughs> but it, it's, it's a beautiful place. It has... I don't know if they're unique, but it has a, a, a huge quantity of beautiful rock formations. The color of the rocks is a very warm sandstone, orange-red, oh. which is beautiful in the morning and, and around sunset. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's a huge area and there are, there are a lot of interesting vantage points. Okay. So how do you know where to go when you go to a new place? I look at maps. Uh, you look at maps or I do you look at other people's pictures or well, uh, both? Both. Both. Because people go there to photograph, there are many famous, famous views. 
Um, I, I look at them, of course, but uh, you, you look at the map and you see where it is and you see what direction the, the rising sun or the rising moon will come from mm -hmm. and uh, you, you make a note of it. You, you make a shot list. Okay. And, uh, if, you, if you do it, I mean, it's not, it's not like living there. I mean, it's, the Everglades, we have an advantage for the Everglades. You sure do. But anywhere you go, you can check uh, what the, uh, the moon phases are, what the moon rise is, when sunrise is, the directions. It's very easy. Do you plan your trip around things like that or no? You're just planning the trip and then you, you hope for good. No, I, I, I plan the trips around things like that. Wow. Or at least uh, I, I, take, I make time to now, take photos. Now, who do you travel with? Uh, myself, usually. Do you travel with other photographers? I haven't. You travel on your own all by yourself? Imagine that. Ah! <laughs> I, I've traveled by myself not that much, no, though. No, there, there, there are pluses and minuses to, to going on your own or going with others. Yeah, that's, this is true. I mean, there are a lot of places where you go, like, like in the national parks, where you know, there, there's a crowd right before sunrise. And those are, those are beautiful places, but if you walk a little, you can often find places that are just as nice that aren't uh, Quite so oversubscribed. Crowded. Yeah. And uh, it's worth it. Yeah, and it's not a, you can't you can't uh, visiting someplace uh, uh, as a as a tourist you don't have the the great access that we have here to the Everglades, but it, it's worth trying. Yeah, it's yeah. worth trying things. I am on a kick now that I usually hire a guide, a photography guide. That's when a good I idea. travel because they know where to go. Yeah. And they know when the light is right and they know and I've had amazing luck with photo guides and That's I'm right. just like this is what you know the first time I did it the guy wasn't really a professional photographer or anything but he had lived in that area it was in New Mexico he had lived in that area for a long long time and he just loved photography took it up older when he was older because he was I think he was 80 when he took me on the tour and um, but boy, did he know where to go. It was amazing. And he just, because he loved what he was doing so much, it was a crazy good, he gave me way too much for too little money is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> now, when I went to Tuscany, you know, that guy, it was a business for him. And he sure. gave me what I paid for and nothing more. But he was really good, too, because Tuscany is just a bunch of farmland. How do you know where to go with, unless you have... You know, a guide, or if you have a good map, but still a guide is no, better. No, if I went to Tuscany, I'd probably get a guide. Yeah. I so. think you should try different things and see what works. Yeah. Different people you know, have different preferences. Now, when you're out there photographing in Utah, let's say, what's different? Like, what is really, do you do different settings, do you different equipment than when you're in the Everglades? No, everything's the same. It's always it's the same. It's a different same. place. So I think about different things. Usually I'm living in a tent. Uh, it's a different experience, and I'm very attuned to getting the most out of my visit, and I'm very attuned to being in a new place, so I'm, I'm contradicting my, my argument for coming back again and again, but it's true. You should try new things. I, I should try new things. We all should try new things. We all should try new things. But I like, I like your idea of going back to the same place. You know, I don't do a whole lot of weddings anymore, but I started as a wedding photographer, and the more you know, the more often I worked in a certain venue, the better I got because I knew exactly where to go. So I was faster as part of the thing. But then, you know, you got to see the little nooks and crannies of places that you wouldn't have noticed the first time, maybe. And, and, and taking pictures of the same people over time is probably similar. Well, they're not the same people. Well, they change. They're getting married there only once. Okay. People only get married getting, once. They get married once, ideally. But yeah, right. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes if you're taking pictures of people, I'm sure you take pictures of, of your family members over time. Uh, you get uh, you get different views over time. You, yeah. You get better at seeing things. Yeah. Yeah, that's and true. Nature, that is true. Nature is similar. Nature, like people, changes. Uh, but the more you go back and try, the better the better results you get over time. I really like that. It's, I think that's fabulous advice. So what, uh, what other advice do you have? Let's say I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fairly new at photography and I, I want some advice on going out and photographing in anywhere, in Miami, let's say. Miami would be a good one for me because I, I don't go to Miami that often so I don't know it very well. 
In fact, I've been to South Beach several times, but I had a friend a few weeks ago take me on a bike tour of South Beach. Holy cow, it was like I had never been to South it's Beach different. before. <laughs> it was a totally different. I didn't even know about that path back there yeah. along the beach. Yeah, it's which a great was place. Fun. And you there are a lot they, of interesting people there. It was fabulous. It was a wonderful time. And so I, I really enjoyed it. Of course, Sarah had a guide again, even though he wasn't a photo guy. We didn't really take pictures, took That's a few great. cell phone pictures. <laughs> but uh, I would say go, go out, take pictures, uh, find where the people are. If you mean my what advice for... What if I don't want to take pictures of people? For nature? Uh, or no, just in general. I just don't want to take pictures of people. Go out... Like uh, the cityscapes in, Nap in Miami. Where do you go for cityscapes? Is there I, a good place? Uh, there, there are a few good places. Uh, I've taken in a lot of pictures that I like very much from the William Powell Bridge, which is the bridge between the mainland and Key Biscayne. And it's, it's an accident. It's because I often bicycle over the bridge. And on the on oh, the north you side, just have to stop and say, "Oh, I got to get a picture." Well, the, the 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 side that goes back into the city has beautiful views of the downtown, and I, I've been photographing it over many years, and and the buildings are growing like trees. So Isn't I that funny uh, that they're growing. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it's it's something, and and the light is good, and it's it's actually a, a very beautiful city from that perspective. So this bridge, what's the name of it? The William Powell Bridge. Is it's, it? It's, it's the, the only. Bridge. But there is a. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't no, know. It, it's. it's a, you can go. Well, you, it can be a, not a pedestrian bridge, but there's a area it, for pedestrians. Both. Well, it has a. Uh, it's a wide safe, I guess, is what I'm trying to you, say. You can stop your car and get out on the shoulder, and it's, it's reasonably it's safe. I mean, you I, can park your car on the bridge. You can stop for a while. It's not a problem. Really? I mean, or you can bike over. They have these rental bikes. If That's you, what we did. We re we rented or, bikes. Or you can walk. I mean, you can. If you, I, w I would say park uh, park near the Rusty Pelican restaurant, which is a famous restaurant, and you can find it easily. Rusty Pelican. Yeah, it's a good restaurant too. Okay. And actually, it, the, uh, the restaurant itself has excellent views of the city. Ah. Uh, oh. You you can park there or park nearby. Walk up the bridge with your camera. Uh, ideally, early in the morning when the bridge isn't vibrating a lot. And oh gosh, good. Point. There are many people photographing from the, uh, I don't know what it's called, the, the, uh, the area below the bridge, the, the concrete footing of the bridge. Uh, there, there are people fishing there. There are people looking at the view. People go there to photograph. Not as many go up on the bridge. But you get a better view because it's a different perspective. But you can't really do any night photography from there because your pictures will be shaky. No, from you the can. You can. You just wait. Do it, do it when there isn't much traffic. Like one o'clock, two o'clock. No, not no. that late. Not that late. Really? Just not rush hour. Oh, okay. You, you 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 sort of time it so that nobody's coming. You can see the, you can see the headlights coming. But can you park underneath too, where the people you said, or you, it's the same thing? You'd park there, in the same area and walk. There are different there are different places where you can park, and and it depends on which side of the bridge you're on. And if if you if you look on Google, you can see where they are. You can park in the Rusty Pelican. You can park near Hobie Beach. There's a fishing pier, but the views aren't so good there. Okay. Uh, there, you, you have to sort of drive around there, and you'll see. Basically, you get on the north side of the bridge, and it has nice views of the city, and and it's worth a try. Uh, ah. I, I often make uh, panoramic exposures from that area. Like I, I take several. Oh yeah, I love cityscapes, and it, especially it works like well. if there's water in the front, it always looks so cool. What yeah. about? Are there any cool architectural? Like South Beach is known for the Art Deco buildings. Yeah, South Beach is beautiful. Is there are, what would be a good advice for somebody who wanted to photograph South Beach? Get a boat. Uh, really, is it no, better from? I'm, the I'm half. I'm half joking. The, the but view, is it better from the water? Uh, it it may be now. I, I actually haven't done that, but but uh, they built up the sand dunes there, so the the city is the buildings are not so visible as they used uh, to be. But just walk around. And now, or use what? a or use a drone. Or a, uh, well, you probably can't in a city like that, can why you? Why not? People do it. I don't know. I haven't they have done a lot it, of rules with perhaps. drones. I think I think you could probably get very nice pictures in the morning from the beach there with a drone. Okay, I wonder if that's legal in Miami. Here you can. Uh, there's hardly any place you can use a drone around here. It, there's a lot of rules. It's on It's not drones. a question of whether it's legal. It's a question of whether you can get away with ah! it. Ah! <laughs> I, I See, think you're I, talking like a big city person. Uh, I live in a small town. Like, oh, I don't want to break the rules. Well, <laughs> I, th I think people do it. 
<laughs> I think people do so it. What, what, but, so if you wanted to do Art Deco in, down in at South Beach, right, where yeah. the Art Deco stuff is, so what kind of lens should you have? Should you have a tripod? Why do, do you have to have a full frame? These are questions I, that are popping into my head. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if the full frame or crop frame matters. Uh, as it, long as you have a wide enough lens. Uh, yeah, if you use a wide lens or even if you, you, if you can back up. There are places where you can get perspective on the buildings. Okay. In the morning, it's very good because the sun rises in the east. You get nice light on the buildings. Oh, because are most of the buildings facing towards the water? Some of them are. Okay. Some of them are. The pretty can, ones. Are there any like really special ones that are? Uh, there are. I don't know their you names. You just don't know what they just, are. Okay. You just go just there. Curious. <laughs> Actually, the view the view from from the west is good, but you have to have access to a drone or a high rise. I, I, I've taken pictures there in the past from from uh, the roof of a building on the Venetian Causeway, and you, you can get some nice views. What it, what is the view of? It's 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 just the view of the, the city. It's it's. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it's like a mini Manhattan. You get you get all the old buildings. Are and you, you from New York? You oh no. You referenced New York a few times. That's why. Where are you from? Uh, originally the Washington area. Washington D.C. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just curious because <laughs> you've talked about New York a few times. Well, in Florida, we all come from somewhere. That's it's usually for sure. somewhere else. How long have you been in Florida? About twenty years. Oh, so you've been here a long, long time. So. What else? What else do you have to, to offer for us? What other tips can you give us for, for landscape? Let's say, let's go back to landscape photography. Yeah, take more pictures. Now, are you selling your photography or what are you doing with your photography? Some of them, they're available for, for fine art prints and I have some available for stock. Now, do you sell them on your website or do you go through stock websites, agencies, or do you? For stock, it goes to an agency for uh, some of them. Not uh, Actually, uh, uh, I have many, many that are not offered anywhere. If somebody wants them, they can go to my website, jonathangewartz.com, and contact me. Okay, so it's not spelled out. It's just, no, it's, it's hey, not spelled out. these are available for license if you want, yeah. but yeah. Well, you make more money if you license it yourself, but you have less chance of licensing it if you license it for yourself. <laughs> so I'm, you make less money. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm, I'm better at making photographs than I am at, at the handling marketing the stuff. marketing and negotiations, unfortunately. I think that's a very common feeling well, photographers you're an artist, have. and artists don't like the business side normally, and that's... That's tough because it's yeah. a very competitive business. It's very competitive. So if you don't have that business savvy, you, you struggle with, with that. Yes. You know? And I think most of us do. So, um, but you, okay, so now you said most, well, I shouldn't say you said this because I'm just assuming this from looking at your website. It looks like you're more into landscapes than anything, though. Sure. Yeah. And, and um, you talked about filters. Yes. What kind of filters do you use? Uh, that's interesting. I used to follow sort of uh, dogmatic web advice about you can do anything in post-processing by blending images and that sort of thing. And I, I did that exclusively for a while until I found it's just too much work. And anytime there's wind, uh, you have problems blending two oh, images. images. So I started using graduated neutral density filters, nothing fancy. Okay. But a two or a three stop makes a lot of pictures look better. It's simple. Okay, so now for our audience who doesn't know what that is, explain what a graduated neutral density filter, and they just say ND filter, right? ND, sure. So, but a graduated ND filter is what? What does it do? It's, it's, a, it's a square of, of plastic typically, and one end is darker than the other. And it has like a f graduated It can, fade yeah. I, I prefer the ones that are, that are darkest at the bottom and then have a, 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 an area where they, they fade into, into clarity. Okay. And you can get other varieties, but that's... That's the one uh, you I'm like. I'm trying to keep it simple, and that's what I understand. And it, it, uh, you usually put the, the dark side, you orient the, the filter holder so the dark side is over the, the sky. And the filter just goes right on the front of your lens. Yeah. And you can either, they have them that screw can, on or the can, kind that have a break, bracket that you can just, you yeah, just the, insert the kind, it in the bracket. Yeah, that's what I use. The, okay. the, the screw on, you mean the circular kind? Yeah. Or, do they make those for graduated or They no? do. I don't think it's, I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's not the right way to do it. Uh, the, the easy way and the best way is to get a square filter holder 
Uh, there, there are several brands. I have one by Lee. Uh, it's fine. I, I'm sure and the so others are. so the filter are. holder goes on the lens? The filter holder mounts to an adapter ring which screws into your lens. Okay. So you get a 77 millimeter ring and it, it screws into your lens and then the filter holder goes on that. Okay. And then you slide the filter up and down in the holder and you can, you can turn it so you can get uh, uh, the, the, the shaded part doesn't have to be uh, the, 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 the line between the shaded and the, and the clear part doesn't have to be um, horizontal. You can, you can move it if necessary. Oh, I see what you're saying. And but normally you have it horizontal and you have the dark part The dark part typically, typically on top. the way I use it, it's, which is probably the simplest use, is I use it to darken the sky so that the foreground isn't, isn't so the too graduate, dark. So the dark part is on top. Yeah. And so when you take the picture, instead of having this extreme different exposure like you know your sky would be you know if you were taking the picture you'd have your sky at f22 and right. then but for the bottom you'd really need your f stop at f8 or something and you can't you can't do that you that's just right. can't do that that's right so you're either going to overexpose the sky or over you're going to something's not going to be exposed properly so by using a neutral density filter you're evening the lighting out, basically. Yes. So that you don't overexpose the sky and you can still get the woods or whatever to come out. Yes, and if, so. if it, it, it takes a little practice, but it's pretty simple, and uh, I recommend trying it. Do you know how much they cost? Uh, I don't remember. I think uh, it's, it's, the holder is maybe 100 bucks, the filters are maybe 100 bucks. But they each. last each. Yeah, they're, it's somewhat expensive for what you get. But and they come in different strengths because you said yeah. two or, you use something that's two or three stops that just makes it three or two or three stops darker than. It makes normal. it makes it makes the part you select two or three stops darker. So yeah. it's, it's very it's very good for for sunrises for uh, or or sunsets where you're shooting into the sun. Okay. Or or anything where you have a big a big sky and and the the foreground is darker. Now, do you use? A, other filters too? Sure. Polarizers are, are very helpful. You almost need a polarizer in Florida, right, do you think? Uh, I don't know, but it helps. I mean, it's, what it's, do you use? This? It's a circular polarizing lens, yeah. also called CPL. Yes. What, do, what do you use that for? Uh, I use it uh, because it, it makes, there, there are times when you cheat. Uh, during, during on, on days when, when you can't go out at, at sunrise and have perfectly contrasty light, it darkens the sky. And it makes vegetation, uh, by cutting the reflections, it makes vegetation more vivid and more saturated. It's a nice effect. You, you know, you, you try it. And you can see it. If you're using a, a DSLR, you, see, you can see it through the lens. Uh, you can see the effect through the lens. Yeah, I always you, put it up to, like, especially if there's a cloud, I'll put the, you know, yeah. point the camera up at the cloud and turn the circular, because it turns, right? You screw Absolutely. that on and it turns. So you turn it and you can just see the difference so clearly. Yeah. Or when you're, you're photographing water, it cuts the reflections and uh, it, you can get interesting effects. You can see under the water sometimes. That's cool. It's very cool. Now do you, um, do you, use, like, do you use neutral density filters to do slow shutter speed yes. things? Yes. Like what? Well, uh, uh, I didn't bring an example, but I, I have some pictures. I taken in, in a cypress hammock. Okay. Uh, I have a particular one in mind which, which I like. It's, it's in Paoki Overlook if anybody wants to go. Okay. And it, it's beautiful. It, the, the road goes through a cypress hammock. Uh, cypress hammock again is a grove of trees. Uh, cypress is growing water. There's water flowing under the road. Okay. And uh, if you if you, um, if you put on like uh, an eight stop uh, neutral density which, which is what I have. You can do it with anything. To, you can get, you can you can blur the water because the water is moving uh, during and, and get a good exposure and everything else, a slow exposure, and S it's a nice effect. Yeah, I love that because it makes the water all silky. It makes it makes it creates an impression of tranquil tranquility, which is beautiful. So what this eight stop ND filter and this covers the whole lens, right? Yes. So what this does is it makes, like if you, okay, so let's say you go and you, you meter on the water and it says F8 at, I don't know, let's say, I yeah. don't know, 200th of a second yeah. at 100 ISO. So you put that eight stop filter on the top yeah. of your lens and then you have to 
if you want a good exposure, you have to change your settings to go eight stops right. lighter. Right, which means... Which means your sl shutter speed goes slower and slower and slower. Exactly. But you can't do that. Why can't you do that without a filter? Well, you can, but you, you run out of adjustability if you're at ISO 50 and, and uh, uh, your limit is two or three seconds at F22. You, you can't get enough of a blur on the water. And they're so limited because it's too bright outside. It's too bright. So what you want is to be able so to do... So that darkens. So you could do that in the daytime. Yes. Where really the only other time you could do it would be in the dead of night. Right? Exactly. When it was pitch dark or something, right? Exactly. <laughs> okay, so, you so can, that's what the filters, the ND filters will do. Yeah, you can get a, a 30 second uh, minute exposure, whatever you need, and it'll be properly exposed and you'll, you'll get the blur of the motion. And there, there are a lot of pictures of uh, beach scenes that are like this. We've well, all seen. I love the slow shutter speed. They're very nice. I love that effect. The silky water. I like. I like to play with slow shutter speeds for everything, like for streaking lights of the cars and. Yeah, that's a good one. I'm, I'm into it. I'm into it. But that yeah. you don't need a neutral density filter for for the streaking lights because. Because it's it's dark at night. Because it's night, so you can go slow with your shutter speed. I was going to say because it's bright at night. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you get the idea, but you can use it during the day, and then you get blurred lines of traffic, which is nice. I and have never tried that. It's worth trying. I there, might there, do that. There's a photographer, I don't remember his name, who, who uses this effect with crowds of people, uh, with black and white. Oh, I've seen, I've done that, actually, not it's, even it's, with a filter, just because you can, yeah. mo a lot of times it's cloudy or whatever, and you can blur the people, and it's kind of cool. It's cool. One guy, I met him in Paris a million years ago, when I, not one million, but five years ago, whenever I went, and he never did get in contact with me. I gave him my card, but he didn't have a card. But he was in the busy area of Montmartre, 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 Montmartre. I can't say it. And he had his tripod, and he said, oh, I'm just gonna take pictures here, like for an hour, and this will look like there are no pic people here. I was like, I want to see those pictures, but I couldn't remember his name, and so I never did. <laughs> that's he, a never, shame. he never showed me. So that, that's another thing you can do, though. Slow shutter speed do that. stuff you is fun, and if you've got those dark ND filters, they help a lot. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, software. Okay, let's talk about software. Uh, not, not that I know much, but uh, it's, it's very nice to be able to blend exposures, okay. either, either for HDR pictures or, or to. Uh, uh, what I like to do is make stitch panoramas, which I think a lot of people do. Photoshop now does this perfect, almost perfectly. I, I used to have to uh, make a lot of corrections because I often take panoramas without a tripod, which I, I think is, um, the, re the results are not, it's not 100%. Right. It's a lot easier with a tripod. And, and there would be, you know, th something would be, uh, the, wouldn't brand, match the branch up would, exactly right. wouldn't match. Or, Building, the building would have a jagged edge that wasn't real, and you'd have to fix it. And now it, it works. It works very well. And HDR also uh, I use Photomatix, which is a popular program. You can do it in lots of ways. You can blend them manually. It, you have to be careful not to overdo it, but it's a very nice technique under some conditions. One, one time, uh, one type of condition when it's good is taking uh, sunset or sunrise pictures against the sun into uh -huh. the sun. Okay. You can get natural looking, more natural looking pictures if you don't overdo the effect and, and they can look really good. And so when you use HDR, first you shoot three different exposures, right? Of the same picture? Uh, or five different exposures? Yeah, it, it's, usually, it's usually more like five or you seven. Five, you have to, you have to play with it. And like so everything. you'll do like two dark, a little dark, usually, medium, yeah, yeah. just right, overexposed, yeah. way overexposed. Yeah, usually I figure out uh, what's, um, you know, I trial and error. I don't always think about the numbers, but I, I, I expose for the, the brightest light. So the, the, that'll generally make everything else very dark. And then I, I start uh, opening, up. opening up maybe two stops at a time, depending on the scene, sometimes one stop at a time. You want to end up with maybe five, to seven photos, five is usually ideal if you can if you can encompass the visual the the brightness range, and and then you run it through the software and the software first it lines all the pictures up for you it lines so you don't well, have to line them up if if you can use a tripod it works a lot better okay because they'll be lined up anyway yes and okay. and of course you try to take the pictures immediately one after another and many cameras 
uh, have a setting it, yes. where you can you just press it, you yeah, set it, it that way. Click, 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 and right. it does them Click, all. click, and yeah. it's all done. And the software then will often give you crazy results, and you have to play with it and try different settings. But what it's doing is it's going to pull the the whites or the light, the brights out, and you know, darken them and, and lighten the d whatever so exactly. that you have it's an even looking lighting. It's, it's taking it's taking the well exposed parts of the of, of each image, whether they're the bright parts or the dark parts and, and, and then blending blending them. Yeah. And throwing out the, the less but well exposed. But you're right, parts. you can overdo it and it can look like a cartoon. <laughs> if you don't, if it's, you're not it's careful. an interesting look. Although some people like that. I mean there's some really cool things that you can do with that photomatic software, especially, it's the easiest stuff to use I've ever seen, yeah, too, which easy. is something that I like about yeah. photomatics. Me, too. So now, where can our audience find you? Well, as I said, I have a website, jonathangewartz.com. How, how do you spell the whole thing? I'll spell Jonathan's it Jonathan's one of those, it's like, is it an A or is it, you know, go ahead. Well, you have to talk to my parents. It was <laughs> J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N-G-E-W-I-R-T-Z.com. Dot com. And we are going to put that on our website in the show notes, understandphotography.com. We'll have that on, the web, on, on his show notes, too. Um, what, what's coming up for you next? Well, that's a good question. I've, I've been very busy with other kinds of business projects for the past few years, and I'm, I'm looking forward to being less busy and getting back into doing more or spending more time on photography. Uh, one, one thing I'd like to do is spend an entire summer in the Everglades just... Mm photographing the weather because the the it's so beautiful in it's the beautiful the, the storms are beautiful they're they're essentially every day or several times a day um, time lapses of the storms it's Ooh. something I would like to do Ooh, that sounds uh, but fun. but just the, uh, the clouds over the landscape are, are extremely beautiful amazing and it'd be worth it um, there's some I mean I'd like to do some more travel Photography. There are a few places I'd like to go. Back to Moab. Um, Israel is a place I like very much. You've been there? Yeah. Wow. It's, it's, a, it's a very good place for photography. And history. History, yeah. Well, That's it's all there. so cool. Yeah, it's there. Also, uh, street <laughs> photography. Oh, yeah. you got all different cultures. And, 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 and people seem not to mind, at least yeah. the ones I've seen. So it's, it's a good place. And the, the, it, it has many, many climates in a small area. So I, I like it. I'm probably going to go back. And I, I think uh, I, I have some, some ideas I probably never do, but uh, uh, the history of, of the city of Chicago uh, through its different streets is, a, is an, I don't think it's, I don't think I can do it. I think it's a job for, for somebody a, who lives there. Somebody who lives there over yeah. a lifetime or a large group of people. But uh, um, I used to live there, and, and it's, it's a fascinating city. It's a fascinating city. It literally has many layers and many periods, and and much change. And uh, it has iconic streets. And if you if you put a camera in the center of uh, Halstead Street or whatever, at at uh, some uh, at some location, how would it look uh, versus ten years ago, a hundred years ago? That's cool. I've seen pictures like that on the internet. That's too. If I ever go back to Chicago, I'm going to Farron's Pub. Somebody okay. had a pub you should. with my last name. <laughs> well, thank you for being on the show, Jonathan. I really thank appreciate you for inviting it. Remember, me, Peggy. remember our show notes from today's episode will be on the understandphotography.com website. Join us next week for episode 114 with fine art photographer Michael Joseph. I think he might be from Miami or Fort Lauderdale as well. Um, I'm Peggy Farron. Thanks for watching the Understand Photography Show. We'll see you next Friday. Yeah.